Okay, Tom O'Boyle has given me the thumbs up on launch, so I guess we'll take off. Let me go ahead and open us in prayer today. Lord, we pray for your presence in our midst today and, and a presence in our fellowship and our attitude towards each other. And we ask that as we consider these matters together, at, um, as I always pray, that... Um, we would be discerning and sorting things out and spitting out the bones and swallowing the meat. And I pray that you would give me grace as I, as I share these things today as well. Uh, and we pray for these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> my throat's a little off today. I, I don't think I'm really actively sick anymore, but I, I had a pretty serious cold this week, so what it did was it left my throat pretty raw. So I think we're in good shape, but, you know, we will, you know, move along. Okay. Today, I want to talk about, last week I talked about, I started a, a two-part series on just understanding the beauty of marriage. And as I said, my inspiration comes from the concept, a uh, very biblical concept of cosmos, which is a harmonious order, which is in itself beautiful, in which God created and, and gave us to overcome chaos. And that marriage is a aspect of that cosmos. It is a beautiful, harmonious order. It's not only functionally good, but it's aesthetically pleasing. Our response to it should never be merely intellectual. Uh, we should be able to delight in it as something that is beautiful, like a, like a lovely song. And we should also be able to delight in how God gives it to us to push back uh, evil and to help us to function in a very, very difficult world. And um, what I want to talk about today is the beauty of marriage as it's revealed in the basic purposes of marriage, without making this a kind of a technical discussion. So let me go ahead and, 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 and kind of launch into my prepared talk. I'm sorry, I'll probably have to sniff every now and then. Just as God's basic framework for marriage is simple, one man and one woman united as one flesh as long as both live. So the basic aims or purposes of marriage can be remembered easily and recited by any school child with very little effort. However, like so much else about marriage, there is power and beauty embedded into the simplicity. God kind of takes delight in hiding profound things from the foolish and revealing them to the weak and the lowly. And marriage is one of those things. But just as I kind of shifted to the concept of cosmos last week, pointed out why I used the term beautiful order, but why it doesn't really quite get at what I mean. Um, I want to fo focus on the term telos today because I think it gets at better what I mean by the purposes of marriage. Now another way to talk about the purpose, aim, or function of marriage or anything else is to refer to those purposes or functions as something called telos. As a philosophical colleague of mine said recently, telos refers to goal or animating purpose. The term telos captures better the richness and power of everything in God's created order, including marriage, because God builds every aspect of reality with telos embedded in it. He doesn't send anything out empty. It all has a purpose just as your life has purpose. 
The purposes of God are built into everything he designed, and these purposes are part of and directed always toward the completion of his good, holy, and perfect will. They are designed to accomplish our good and God's glory, including to aid us in achieving his ultimate purposes for us. We see this powerful concern with telos in the very first question and answer in the Westminster Catechism. One that establishes the very meaning of our existence, or we could say, tells us why we exist. The question is, what is the chief end? Notice the word end of man. End is just another way of saying telos, or animating purposes. And the answer to the question, of course, is man's chief end, again, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And by the way, I like Piper's spin on that. We glorify him by enjoying him through all the circumstances of life, the good and the evil. When we enjoy God, we bring him glory. He wants us both, and he wants them combined in the way that we live. So our ultimate animating purpose is, in life is to glorify and enjoy God. And as immortals, we are preparing to do this, as the Westminster Catechism says, forever. Interestingly, while preparing this talk, I searched the word telos in my browser looking specifically for images that depicted telos. I was actually really shocked by this. All I did was put the word telos, hit Google, or actually DuckDuckGo, I don't like Google, and then select images. Every single image that appeared on my screen, and this continued for a while, Every single image that appeared on my screen were various depictions of the first question and answer in the Westminster Catechism. I guess I'm not the only one who connects the word telos with the opening passage of our catechism. In fact, one of the images that popped up on the screen is what's in front of you right now. And let me, quick aside, and hopefully I have time for this, but in my profession we talk about something called the teleological error. Teleological error is the assumption that, that the purposes of something explain the reason for its existence, right? It's called the teleological error. But the teleological error doesn't apply to things that God created. The purposes do explain their existence because we're not talking about something secondary or tertiary way down the line that evolved over time. When we talk about the teleology of God's design, including the teleology of God's design in marriage, and say that is the reason for its existence, that is not a teleological error. And I, I know your pastor has a philosophical background and he probably recognizes this argument. When we're talking about God's creation, it is teleological. In other words, teleology is the cause, but it's an unmoved cause. It's God himself determining that of his own free and perfect will. He's not compelled to do anything. He does it because it's good and he wants to. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. These purposes are clearly touched on in the Genesis passage we looked on in the first part of our discussion of sex in a single evangelical. And then again last week as we began this class on God's design for marriage, and I'm not going to repeat that here. These animating purposes are affirmed and masterfully summarized in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Unfortunately, we often only hear them repeated at weddings, where they are typically not explained and discussed in detail. And even just reciting the aims of marriages the aims of marriage at weddings is becoming increasingly uncommon, especially as weddings become more and more detached from the church and from established church liturgical things. God's purposes of marriage are not taught about or applied often enough. 
Here's a passage from, conf conf from the Confession, and I added numbers to this to show what the three purposes are. Okay, there it is. Marriage was ordained for the mutual help of husband and wife, for the increase of mankind with a legitimate issue and of the church with a holy seed, and for preventing of uncleanness, which is a discreet way of saying to preserve our chastity by preventing fornication. Clearly, then, the purposes of marriage are these, mutual help and companionship, a legitimate means of sexual fulfillment, or following what we talked about a couple weeks ago, a legitimate way to preserve our chastity, and for the procreation and rearing of children, which for Christians means doing this in ways that build, build Christ's church by giving to the Lord godly offspring who will, in turn, God willing, carry this on in their own marriages and families. I like the beauty and power of how these purposes are expressed in matrimonial service in a classic Anglican Book of Common Prayer. This fully agrees with the Westminster Confession, but the language, I think, is more potent. And it's actually stunning. It's aesthetically beautiful. And besides, it reminds me of the lovely wedding scene in the last installment of the BBC serial version of Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> where Darcy and Bingley marry the older Bennett sisters in a double wedding in a beautiful old stone Anglican church. And I am romantic at heart. By the way, I couldn't put that thing down. We were making fun of the women for watching Pride and Prejudice when it first came out. It was on a series of VCRs, and I wasn't the only guy that did this. The next thing you know, I'm like, put in the next tape, put in the next tape, quick, quick. <laughs> Rule for marrying heirs' daughters. Be Bingley or Darcy. One of the two. They're, they're perfectly good personality types. Um, any anything morally inferior to that, uh, please don't bother. Okay. Here's the version that's remained most intact from 1662. <laughs> Matrimony is an honorable estate instituted of God in the time of man's innocency, signifying to us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate God ordained, or Christ ordained and beautified, with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee, and is commended of St. Paul to be honorable among all men. And therefore is not to, by any to be enterprised nor taken in hand unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly, to satisfy men's carnal lusts and appetites <laughs> like brute beasts that have no understanding. Can you imagine the Episcopalians doing that today? I don't to want to rag on them, but let's face it. <clears throat> Calvin said that as well. M marriage is partly so that we don't end up living like brute beasts, driven by lust. You know, people used to say stuff like that. Okay. But reverently, discreetly, <laughs> advisedly, soberly, and in the fear of God, duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the procreation of children, to be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained for remedy against sin and to avoid fornication, that such persons as have not the gift of continency, which is most of us, might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of Christ's body. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society help and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity. Let me briefly touch upon each of these purposes in turn to help us see how valuable and lovely they are, and all the more so in contrast to the increasing ugliness and confusion of modern culture. Mutual help and companionship. Marriage is ideally more than friendship, but it is not less than friendship either. Our spouses should be our dearest friends, our friends for life, our friend for both good times and those that are filled with trouble. Moreover, in Christian marriage, our spouse ought to be a friend who is also a helper 
in many aspects and endeavors of life, but ultimately our helper as we seek to serve, glorify, and enjoy God together day by day. Our spouse should help us grow in Christian devotion and maturity. They should be jealous for our moral good. Aristotle pointed out that we can have friends who are merely useful to us or whose companionship we find pleasurable. Such relationships can be mutually satisfying and legitimate, but the highest form of friendship, says Aristotle, is when each passionately desires the highest moral good in the other, where what makes us happiest is to watch the other person grow in virtue. That's what marriage ought to be. And in a Christian sense, this means that each partner is jealous to see the other grow in biblical moral virtue, to see the other person become more like Christ. I'm not implying that we cannot have friends like this outside of our marital union. We can, and ideally we should. Married people need solid friendships. Social isolation is not good for marriage. But in a sound Christian marriage, our spouse should be our dearest and most important friend and of this type. As we've already seen in Genesis 1 and 2, this is part of God's design for the very beginning. Some of our Christian, especially Puritan forebears, could be quite eloquent, even ecstatic, in speaking about this beautiful aspect of marriage. For example, here is Richard Baxter from a Christian directory in the late 1600s. It is a mercy to have a faithful friend that loveth you entirely and is true to you as yourself, to whom you may open your mind and communicate your affairs and who would be ready to strengthen you and divide the cares of your affairs and family with you and help you to bear your burdens and comfort you in your sorrow and be the daily companion of your life and partaker of your joys and your sorrow. And it is a mercy to have so near a friend to be a helper to your soul, to join with you in prayer and other holy exercises, to watch over you and tell you of your sins and dangers, and to stir up in you the grace of God and remember of you the life to come and cheerfully accompany you in the ways of holiness. I get a brief aside here. I know men whose wives are afraid to tell them stuff that's going to anger them. That should never be the case. If there's anyone on this planet, men, that needs to be able to tell you the truth, even when it stings, it's your wife. That's what she's there for. You need that. I need that. And I love this quote <clears throat> Sorry, from Charles Haddon Spurgeon writing about 200 years later, although Spurgeon was a Puritan, no doubt about it. He connects this to the fact that in marriage, the two become one flesh. How should we call that a marriage where the husband and wife are still two persons, maintaining individuality as if that were a scrupulous condition of the contract? That is utterly in foreign to the divine idea. In a true marriage, the husband and wife become one. Henceforth, their joys and their cares, their hopes and their labors, their sorrows and their pleasures rise and blend together in one stream. In their book, The Meaning of Marriage, Tim and Kathy Keller point out that Adam found in Eve the friend his heart had been seeking. Moreover, say the Kellers, our godly spouse is our special confidant. This is someone to whom we will turn time and again for wisdom, encouragement, refuge from the difficulties of life, and to comfort us. Someone we will confess our sins and shortcomings to. Someone who will regularly bring our needs before God in prayer. Moreover, in Christ, our marriage is literally a threefold cord that is not easily broken. As the preacher describes in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, about the threefold cord. This is why that Puritan divine, the venerable and reliable Matthew Henry, said that this passage in Ecclesiastes deals not only with friendship, generally, but with marriage. We could find this in friendships outside marriage, but in the marital union it should always find its highest expression. When two are closely joined in holy love and fellowship, Christ will by his Spirit come to them and make the third. As he joined himself to the two disciples going to Emmaus, 
And then there is a threefold cord that can never be broken. They that dwell in love dwell in God and God in them. This aspect of marriage, mutual help, companionship of comfort, is of enormous benefit to individuals and by extension to society as a whole. Given how critical the love and help of others in whom we can absolutely trust no matter what is, in buffering the impact of trouble, and in practically responding to challenges we face, this should not surprise us at all. We can see the value of healthy marriage powerfully today as we consider the epidemic of loneliness now plaguing American society. In a recent Harvard study of loneliness among contemporary Americans, 36% of respondents reported feeling lonely frequently or almost all the time in four weeks prior to being surveyed. As the authors note, the cost of loneliness is high. Loneliness is linked to early mortality and a wide array of serious physical and emotional problems, including depression, anxiety, heart disease, substance abuse, and domestic abuse. While it would be overstating things to say that marriage is the only factor cited or a cure-all, it was extremely important. Those who were single, separated, or divorced were significantly more likely to be suffering from debilitating levels of loneliness. This is one reason we in the church need to pay special attention to socially connecting with the older singles, divorced, and widows among us. They easily fall prey to loneliness. The Genesis account reminds us that God created marriage because he saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Here's a treasure wrapped in brown paper embedded in the mundane and ordinary fabric of life. Husband and wife as companions and practical helpmates across the decades of life together. However many years God chooses to give them together on this earth. Not only in times of ease, comfort and blessings, but through seasons of tribulation and adversity. The fruit of their mutual love, support, and labors together bless their children and their larger world. It is a lovely, beautiful thing, as the preacher notes in Ecclesiastes 9.9, which we looked at last week, but it's worth repeating. Enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life that he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. And there's beauty in that. By the way, I read something last year online that really struck me, I think particularly because of the eloquent way that this man put it. He said, the person that you marry, one of you is going to bury the other one. That's how long your care extends. And then that person will be left alone. And that's the rhythm that God has given us in this fallen world. And there's comfort in it. I'm not alone. Legitimate sexual fulfillment. In our twisted modern culture, and even too often among professing Christians, God's design that sexual relationships are exclusively tied to the marital covenant are viewed by many as a burden, if not as oppressive, anachronistic oddities. Far to the contrary, the rails that God has put around this wonderful thing called sex not only direct sexual relations toward his holy and perfect purposes, but are conducive to our own greatest happiness, protection, and fulfillment. To pursue sex outside of marriage rather than striving for true biblical chastity, abstinence out of marriage and covenant faithfulness within marriage is to settle for dried out fast food hamburgers and ones with a, th with a high threat of food poisoning to boot. <laughs> Rather than holding out for fine aged sirloin prepared for us by the master chef. By the way, I, I didn't put this in here. It was uh, Paul Newman was asked on a talk show before he died how he'd been so faithful to his wife for decades in Hollywood when everybody else just cheated like crazy. He said, why would I, go, why would I get hamburgers when I got steak at home? <laughs> <laughs> so 
C.S. Lewis' famous admonition from his weight of glory is relevant to how we ought to view the modern cheapening of sex and its decoupling from the marital covenant over and against what God desires for us, what he, he wants for us. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling around with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We're far too easily pleased. As I noted in my book, Christian Marriage, people caught up in a sex-crazed culture cannot understand the beauty and depth of marital eros any more than a street drunk can appreciate a fine Pinot Noir compared to a cheap bottle of hooch. Sex is not about powerful physical experiences, so of course there's going to be such times. It's about the everyday comfort and connection of two deeply committed people, young, middle-aged, or old, in each other's arms. Consider this lovely reminder from Proverbs 5, 18 and 19. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be intoxicated always in her love. As the Puritan divine Thomas Hooker said, marital love ought to be like the longing each of us ought to have for Christ. It is not about mere physical gratification or pleasure one spouse gets from the other, but about the longing and hunger for the person, him or herself. It's not sex you desire. It's that person that one person more important to you than any other person. This does not erase our sexual passion. It liberates and directs them properly. Here's the Puritan divine William Gow taken from his classic book, Domestical Duties. The faithful saints of God before mentioned, as also many other like to them, were no stoic without all affection, nor did they think it a matter unbeseeming them after a peculiar manner to delight in their wives, witness Isaac sporting with his wife. By the way, please dismiss from your mind all that nonsense about the dour Puritans. <laughs> they were far more open about discussing this stuff from the pulpit than almost any evangelical pastor today. For this is a privilege which appertains to the estate of marriage. Let it be noted that the affection whereof I speak is not carnal, sensual, beastly affection but one having relation to the soul of a man's wife as well as her body, grounded in the near conjunction of marriage and in the inward qualities of his wife. What an antidote to the ills of modern life and what a witness to Christ, to Christian view, marital sex is once we properly understand and teach it. If you would indulge me, I would like to expand on this by quoting myself from my book, Christian Marriage, again. Many souls around us are tired of empty sex. They're sick of using and being used, of performing and having their worth evaluated on how well they gratify another's essential appetites. Tired of wondering where they rank among the 20 or 30 who've come before them. As the Roman poet Lucretius pointed out, real love between a man and a woman is actually a distraction for those intent on experiencing sex as a mammalian rush. And we'll talk about that next week. That's where hookup comes from. You don't want emotional commitment to interfere with your delights. You want to be free to take what you want and hit the road. The Hugh Hefners of this world know nothing about true marital lovemaking or its higher joys. As Christians, we can call our fellows out of this gilded trap into something as far beyond that as an ocean is to a puddle. We can celebrate sexual union that points ultimately to him who is the perfect fulfillment of every legitimate human desire. Procreation and the rearing of children. It should be clear from all that we've said that the framework of marriage as God designed it is a perfect environment in which to have and raise children. The stability, warmth, constancy, loyalty, and affection that the husband and wife have for each other can and ought to envelop and benefit their offspring. Attaching sex exclusively to marriage ensures that children are born into this covetal mental union of two made into one flesh by the very God who is a third cord in the unity of the children's parents' relationship. 
Though God will not bless every marriage with children, it is certain that they are a high reward and a delight. As Solomon said in 127, verse 3 and 4, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. As I reminded us last week, every child we have will live forever. As C.S. Lewis remarked, their lifespan as a mortal soul makes the entire length of the most powerful and secure civilizations in the history of the world, like the life of a gnat or a fly by comparison. And yet in this brief span of time we have with them, God has so designed humankind that the parents' influence upon their children will make for good or ill a vital difference for all that follows into eternity. It's an awesome thing to be given by God a child. What a remarkable thing this is. Our children are a sacred trust given to us to exercise within the protective framework of covenant marriage. For those parents unable to offer this to their children for whatever reason, and those children who do not have this, we who are married need to stand by and be prepared to help them. Not to judge them, but to support them. There's something sacred, holy, and mysterious about the relationship of a parent and child. In fact, over and over in Scripture, God uses our relationship with our children to teach us about his own relationship to us, including our dependence upon him and the manner in which he loves and cares for us. To name just one example, and there's a lot of them, consider what Jesus taught us in Luke 11, verse 11 through 13. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them? One of the delightful things I encountered in my historical research was a marvelous passage in, in an essay called The Estate of Marriage by Martin Luther. It has all of Luther's typical earthiness. If there is any statement by a reformer on how the experience of caring for children can improve us spiritually and focus our attention back on those things which are most permanent and important, rather than constantly fretting about the things the world tells us we ought to care about, it is this lovely quote. Luther asks us to look beyond the drudgery of the day-to-day -day spiritual reality and to see what's behind it. He's talking literally here about fathers how they should feel about their babies crying, keeping them up all night, dirty diapers, puking on their shoulder, rashes, uh, and everything else that goes with raising a child. And then they become teenagers and you, you wish all you were getting was puking and pooping and rashes. <laughs> Let's see. What then does the Christian faith say to this? It opens its eyes, looks upon these those insignificant and despised duties in the spirit, and is aware that they are all adorned with divine approval as with the costliest gold and jewels. It says, O God, because I am certain that thou hast created me as a man and hast from my body begotten this child, I also know for certainty that it meets thy perfect pleasure. I confess to thee that I am not worthy to rock the little babe, or wash his diapers, or to be entrusted with the care of the child and its mother. How is it that I, without any merit, have come to the distinction of being certain that I am serving thy creature and thy most precious will? Oh, how gladly will I do so, though the duty should be ever more significant and despised. Neither frost nor heat, neither drudgery nor labor will distress or dissuade me, for I am certain that this is pleasing. And I say, and what about avoiding the idolatry of marriage? A few years ago, because the Puritans wrote a lot about that too. A few years ago, there was quite a controversy on Twitter over Kevin DeYoung tweet that warned about evangelicals making idols out of marriage and family. He was attacked viciously for this, by the way. He later responded with an article in the Gospel Coalition explaining this in more detail. 
The fact is that, just as the Puritans often felt called to do, we who seek to build commitment to biblical marriage and family life and praise its excellencies and beauty do need to warn about the dangers of making an idol of it, just as anything in God's good creation can become an idol. The fact that today those seeking to deflect Christian concerns about the decline of marriage will often erroneously claim that we who raise such concerns are making an idol out of marriage. And that's a red herring. That, that's not why, we're, why we express concern about what's going on. However, this does not mean that making an idol out of marriage is not a legitimate concern we ought to address. Because as DeYoung noted, just about every pastor has seen people putting their marriages, parents, children, and family ahead of God. As important as our marriages and our children are, they are not more important than God, and we must never treat them as if they are. Can I indulge myself again in a quote from my book, Christian Marriage, on this? In writing that book, I had the chance to think long and hard about how I would set forth a powerful vision of the beauty of Christian marriage without turning it into an idol. And I believe, you know, imperfectly, I was able to distill the issue somewhat there. I agreed with Dion. De and those of us who talk about how wonderful marriage is need to be the first to make sure that what we say isn't used that way. And by the way, because those who are not married or who lose their spouses or divorced, oftentimes without any, any choice in the matter, are, have a life before God. The substance of my Christian life is not my marriage. Those things that make a marriage beautiful are the same thing that God gives his people by a spirit that make Christianity lovely. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is why marriages can never be beautiful when we make them into idols. Expecting them to deliver, in happiness, to deliver happiness and fulfillment as ends in themselves. All the purposes that God has given to marriage are to help us ultimately to glorify and enjoy God and to serve him. They point to the eternal and help us as we walk, grow, and hope in Christ. God must be preeminent in all things, including our marriages. In them, as in all else, we must hold loosely to the things of this world, looking ultimately to our eternal destiny and hope. Then and only then can we fully realize all that our marriages have to offer us and the world and be the kinds of husbands or wives best suited to help our spouses find their truest fulfillment and joy. The best husband I can be requires that I love God more than my wife. And ditto in reverse. She has to put God our marriage will pass away. It is of this life, as we are taught in Matthew 2, 23 through 30. In heaven we will be like angels, and the marriage that matters will be that between Christ and us, his people. The weight and significance of what we have done in our earthly marriage will remain, that is true. Our marriages themselves are meant to be beautiful and fulfilling, and what we do in our marriages is meant to be work of eternal significance but they can never take the place of God. Spouses should point each other ultimately to God for their fulfillment, meaning, and hope. Only then can they find in marriage all that they're meant to find there. Okay, and lastly, what about singleness? All I've just said points then naturally to the fact that singleness can and ought to be a respected, honor state, honored state for Christians, not despised as a second-class reality, whether it is permanent or temporary. Marriage is a rich source of companionship and purpose, which God calls most humans to enter into eventually. However, singleness is not just a cross to be born until people get married. In fact, history and the scriptures give us many examples of godly singleness that was incredibly fruitful and fulfilling, including the Apostle Paul, who was probably a widower, by the way, but also more contemporary figures such as Amy Carmichael, John Stott, and for most of his life, C.S. Lewis. There are many who lived exceedingly fruitful Christian lives prior to their marriage, 
such as Richard Baxter and Martin Luther. The great German theologian and pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by the Nazis while he was still engaged. Regardless, no one should rush into marriage just to enjoy companionship, sex, or children. <laughs> Even for those called to be married eventually, not being married is better than being in an ill-conceived bad marriage. Still, although they should enjoy life beyond what we call specifically religious activities, Christian singles should be encouraged to use their freedom with purpose to serve the Lord, as Paul discusses in 1 Corinthians 7. They should certainly be plugged into active membership, service to and ministry from the church, and not just work, school, and recreation. And of course, as Paul noted in his History and Common Sense teaches us, there are areas of ministries that are best pursued by the single. I don't know why we have married missionaries doing missionary work in rural Pakistan. I mean, I'm not good. I'll just leave it there. I think that's ministry best left to the single because the chance of being slaughtered is astronomically high. A distinct challenge singles will face, especially in the current age, is sexual temptation. And as Paul also says in 1 Corinthians, the long-term solution for sexual desire is marriage and then honorable and regularly coming together as husband and wife. Until then, God calls us to abstinence. We must never stop saying this, no matter what the world tells us. It will also be important for singles to appreciate how much the presence of godly marriages within the church blesses and anchors it, and including enriching their lives. They should never look down on the limitation and duties faced by married couples, viewing them and their children as distractions and irritations. I hope I've managed to communicate uh, this week and last week, however imperfectly, the beautiful order of Christian marriage to help us appreciate God's marvelous plan and design. This is nothing compared to what I've read on this subject from the greatest Puritan divines and reformers such as Luther. And by the way, I would add some, some pretty profound Catholic people, including Pope Benedict, who was fantastic on this stuff, as was John Paul II. It is they who help me to, along with the scriptures, see within marriage a divine institution created by a wise and loving God, pregnant with possibility, spiritual meaning, and eternal weight, and to avoid being sterile and practical in the way that I discuss it, and failing to communicate its loveliness and inherent goodness. And now I'd be happy to entertain questions and comments. Sorry about, again about my voice. I think we have a little bit of time for that if you have anything you'd like to raise. I know it's not that kind of talk, by the way, but... <coughs> Next week we're going to be dealing with um, the mutual support, comfort, and help from a practical standpoint. And we're going to be looking at the fact that what we know from social science and what the scriptures teach us align virtually perfectly about how to basically have a marriage that actually delivers the goods. Uh, through the normal practice of the Christian life applied within our marriages. And so it'll be a very practical talk. It'll be a little bit different. Okay? If you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm really easy to find, ARSDJ at gcc.edu. And um, have a great Sunday. Um, and I will see you, God willing, next week. <laughs>